assessments. He was recently selected as a lead author for the upcoming IPCC 6th assessment report. So thank you, Dr. Weiner, for joining us on today's NOAA Science Seminar. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Katie and Tracy. Just to check, you can hear me fine? Yes, we yes. can. OK, great. So um, yes, I'm going to talk about chapter 8, which um, is uh, one of uh, 14 chapters in the uh, uh, Climate Science Special Report. Um, all of this is presently on um, the internet, and I encourage people to uh, uh, take a look at the actual report, and I'll show a link at that at the end of the presentation. So this is an important slide that that is a disclaimer. It says that everything I say today is my opinion, and not necessarily that of the United States Department of Energy, the um, uh, University of California or the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, or for that matter, even my other co-authors. These are my opinions and mine alone. I'd like to start with drought. And drought is often a confusing subject um, when uh, uh, spoken about, both in the scientific as well as in the popular literature. And I think it, it's, it's best to start out with a definition of drought. And in fact, um, NOAA defines a hierarchy of droughts uh, starting with meteorological drought, which is a, a, a deficit in precipitation, so low precipitation compared to the average. Another, the next level is agricultural drought, which is, um, as, it, as it, you might imagine from the name, relevant to uh, growing things, either uh, uh, natural uh, ecosystems or, or, or agricultural farming systems. And that's a deficit in, in the available moisture um, for plants in the soil. The next level is hydrological drought, which is really that uh, the water available to water resource managers. And then the last is a socioeconomic drought, which could, could be any of these, any of these or all of these kinds of, of, of physical definitions of drought, where the demand simply exceeds the supply. And this website here uh, from NOAA uh, describes these in, in a bit more detail. So I'd like to start with the first key message of our chapter. And um, I, I think I'll read it to you. It's worth reading. Um, Recent droughts and associated heat waves have reached record intensity in some regions of the United States. However, by geographical scale and duration, the Dust Bowl era of the 1930s remains the benchmark drought, an extreme heat event in the historical record. We have very high confidence. There is, uh, that's in italics, italics. Most, when it says confidence or likely, that has special meanings, which um, is described in Chapter 1 of the report. While by some measures, drought has decreased over much of the continental United States in association with long-term increases in precipitation, neither precipitation increases nor inferred drought decreases have been confidently attributed to anthropogenic forcings. And if I highlight something in red, that means I'm going to focus in on that part of the message. And so, um, and also, the, I guess I probably should have highlighted the Dust Bowl here, because the next picture... Um, is not in the report, but is in a paper by uh, Svoboda, um, showing the area of the United States in severe to extreme drought, as measured by the Palmer Drought Severity Industry, um, since 1895. And I, hopefully you can see my cursor here. This is the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, and, and an extraordinary large fraction of the United States was in drought at that time. Um, it was an unusual event from the meteorological point of view. It was exacerbated by, by human activities, mostly the way that uh, farming practices in the Midwest were in the, in the, uh, uh, the Great Plains of the day. Um, and that was recognized shortly afterwards. And you can see, if you draw a trend line through this, there, there is it's difficult to see a statistically significant trend. And that's, that's the reason for for the statement that we don't identify a trend. Now, you might say, well, climate change really took off around the 70s, and, and there is a bit of a trend there. But given the, the history prior to that, I think it would be disingenuous to say that this is evidence of an anthropogenic change. We also report, report, note in the report that the Palmer Drought Severity Index, PDSI, is probably not suitable for climate change projections because it's a bit oversimplified in, in the land and tends to give very large values as we go into future warming um, scenarios. And uh, this is a topic of current research. 
Um, it's a little problematic in my opinion because um, the Palmer Drought Severity Index is often used um, to uh, uh, make a claim that a particular county is eligible for disaster relief. And so that, that has some implications that are beyond the scope of what I can talk about, um, but is something to, uh, to consider. So now I want to move on to the second key message, that the human effect on recent major U.S. droughts is, is quite complicated, and, and we don't find evidence um, for a human influence on observed precipitation de deficits. What we mean by that is we don't attribute any trends, and I highlight the word trends, in meteorological drought to a human influence. And um, this picture is actually from National Park Service. Um, uh, but let's go into why that, why I make this statement. These figures are actually from Chapter 6, the precipitation chapter of, of uh, the uh, Climate Science Special Report. And the one on the left here are the observed changes. Now, these observed changes are ro quite robust, and they've been in the second, third, and now fourth climate assessment, U.S. Climate National, uh, National, National Climate Assessment. And people have looked at this and said, well, it looks like there's some climate change here. You know, these are some big, big changes, for instance. And I think I finally have prevailed upon people that this is not evidence of climate change. And in fact, this is evidence of large natural variability, and um, which may not have been fully appreciated in pre previous reports, but I think it is now. And the reason for this statement is actually pretty simple. The, the figure on the right is the projected change, percent change in, in seasonal precipitation. So these should be compared, these four maps should be compared to these four maps on the left. Um, these are, this is the projected change at the end of the century under, under a very high emissions uh, scenario called RCP 8.5, which is a uh, what I call a no policy scenario where there are no policies implemented to, uh, to uh, uh, reduce um, Emissions. I'm getting a little noise. I don't know if you are. Can't hear you. Are you not? You're not hearing me. Oh, uh, there's some loud noise. Uh, let me let me. Let me mute my mic. See if I can help. Ah, it seems like that worked. All right, we back in business. Well, I'm going to keep on and yeah. assume that we are. Okay, good. So, um, so these changes that we project, so that is what we expect to be the human fingerprint. And the, when 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 this map shows this stippling, this these little little dots, you have to really look at the picture in the report to see it clearly. That means we have high confidence in the changes when that the changes are large. When it's hatched, like say in here in the summer then we're saying we have high confidence that the changes are actually small compared to natural variations. And you can see in the summer and the fall, the, change, the projected changes from climate change are not supposed to be particularly large. But they are in the, in the northern uh, United States in the winter and spring. And there's essentially no correlation between the observed changes and what we expect for a considerably larger amount of global warming than when we've, we've uh, experienced. The, the picture on the uh, the projection, the picture on the right, is in a world that's three and a half degrees centigrade warmer than uh, the pre-industrial era. As of now, we've currently experienced only one degree, and so the sig signal is considerably less. And so, what these pictures are telling us is we 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 simply uh, the, the 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 human induced change hasn't re hasn't arisen yet out of the um, out of the natural variability, as climate change detection is a, an attribution is a signal to noise problem essentially. So what this means is that it's difficult to say anything about because there's, because there's no real drying projected outside of the southwest, which we don't really even see in these observed changes. It's really difficult to say if any of the the trends we see in meteorological drought at the largest scales are attributable at least in the United States. And that's actually true probably pretty, pretty much throughout the world. Now, I think last week my, uh, my colleague Tom Knutson talked about detection and attribution. And 
the, the new emerging field uh, called event attribution, which is the um, an activity to try to look at individual weather and climate events and um, and identify the human influence on that event, if any. And um, I hope that he describes some of that. Um, bottom line is that that temperature events like heat waves, like we're currently experiencing, are relatively straightforward. Um, uh, storm events are very hard, and and drought events are are quite hard as well, to um, because it, it's somewhat more complicated. And so this is a list of the studies uh, that we highlighted in the report on on meteorological drought. This is the precipitation deficit, and um, there is some consensus in in at least uh, um, uh, three papers about droughts in Texas. Um, and um, that 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 this plus means that that there was a human influence found, um, but not so much in say I'm going to highlight California as well as to these two interesting um, uh, regions that have been analyzed um, for uh, anthropogenic changes in in drought statistics. So the first one I want to talk about is uh, Texas in uh, 2011. And there's a particular paper um, that um, that one of our students at Berkeley Lab uh, did um, some years ago, and and it was to assess a whole series of events that had been uh, covered previously in special uh, special uh, volumes of the State of the Climate Report, appearing in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, the BAMS Journal. And so, um, so you have to. Uh, uh, that's the caveat: is that I'm I'm quoting here a paper that that um, that, that that I helped design. Um, but this is how attribution works in this case of this this particular Texas drought. Um, the observations are are in are these uh, uh, vertical lines here. There are different sets of of observations. You can see there's actually some uncertainty as to what the actual rainfall during this period. Um, March, April, May, June, July, and August in 2011. And the histograms are um, different uh, simulations from a climate model called the Community Atmospheric Model, uh, version 5, which comes out of the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. And there are two sets of simulations. In red is what we call the, the, R, the RW stands for real world or the world that was. And the blue is natural. Um, and natural means an estimate of uh, the world that might have been had humans not interfered with the climate system. And what and the purple purple is where the two are overlapped. And what you can see is that there's a shift in the world that was for a simulation of 2011 um, towards drier um, uh, conditions in this region. Um, and so uh, the distribution is slightly shifted towards the dry compared to 2011 if humans hadn't um, emitted large, large amounts of carbon dioxide. And so um, we conclude that in the, from this model that there's a uh, sign statistically significant um, drying in the region and so there are human influence on the drought. Now there are some caveats involved in this. This was this was only a single model. Um, it has a lot of runs, so it's the statistics are good, um, uh, but the model has a bias. It, it's a little too wet in this region, and and would indicate, in fact, that this um, uh, the return period for these low levels of observed drought would be somewhat greater than 400 years, which is probably a little on the uh, high side. But there are two studies supporting an attribution. We call this kind of attribution, since we weren't able to detect trends in any of these drought statistics, attribution without detection. And so confidence is, um, I wouldn't say it's high, I would say it's at the medium level for, um, for an attribution on this particular drought. California is, um, been more, has been studied more because um, it was such a long-lasting and dramatic drought. Um, and there are six studies, four of which find a human-induced increases in the chances of a, a precipitation deficit in California. But three of those are from this paper that I referred to. So in some sense, those three are only 
uh, one independent study. And so I think at the end of the day, we have two study, two independent analyses finding a, inc a an increase in the chances of a drought and two studies that find no influence. And so it's a very difficult question because uh, if you've paid much attention to, to analyses of this um, drought, that it was caused by something we called the ridiculously resilient ridge. And it was a high pressure ridge off the coast of Western North America that steered storms to the north. And um, this is a circulation anomaly, which are notoriously difficult to attribute. And so uncertainties in this, in the attribution of this drought, and really any meteorological drought, remain reasonably high. Second part of this key message is, is much evidence is found for human influence on surface soil moisture deficits due to increased evapotranspiration caused by higher temperatures. And this statement I wanted to highlight because, you know, we do have good theoretical understanding that evapotranspiration, that's both the evaporation from, um, you know, just dry ground, as well as transpiration, which is um, moisture put in the atmosphere from plants, um, is a strong function of temperature. And so as temperature increases, evapotranspiration increases. And this outpaces any natural or even uh, or human um, increases in precipitation as, um, as the uh, temperature warms. And so when we look, started looking at agricultural drought, there are a number of individual drought attribution studies that, that do show some evidence of, of a human influence. And I'll get to those in a minute, but I wanted to talk about the future, uh, the future as well, because these are so related. Um, and the, 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 this third key message is that future decreases in the surface, this is the top 10 centimeters, in soil moisture from, it, from human forcing, anthropogenic forcing, over most of the United States are likely, as the climate warms under the highest scenarios. And like I said before, the evapotranspiration increases with temperature. And what you see is that, you know, pretty much entirely over the United States in the future under this high emissions, uh, no policy scenario, RCP 8.5, that soil moisture is projected to be uh, decreased um, everywhere. Michael? Almost everywhere. Yes? I'm sorry, we're having, uh, people are having, uh, problems with audio. Some people hear it well and some don't. So um, maybe you could just, I'll try I think to it has to do with the connection that everybody has. So maybe if you could just speak up and maybe lower that might help. All right, I'll I try, I'll, I'll try, I'll try to be louder. Is that better? Yeah, sometimes it's ripped off when you're talking. So yeah, thanks. All right, I tend, I often do that, I often tail off, I apologize. Um, so, the project, back to the projection, the projection is that everything dries out. Um, but these are relatively small variations um, compared to natural variability. So these are all then, then hashed, um, as opposed to stippled, which would say they were large. Um, also, I would point out that, you know, the, the, the big um, uh, decreases in the winter and spring in the southwest do not necessarily uh, uh, translate to the rainier periods in that part of the part of the country. So, into I promise to go to agricultural drought attribution studies. Um, there are uh, three on California, and uh, uh, two find a um, a increase in agricultural drought because of uh, at the surface because of uh, climate change. And then one does, finds that, that it was the opposite. And that study is a little different in that it's looking at uh, soil moisture, at, not necessarily at the surface, but at deeper, uh, deeper uh, uh, depths. <clears throat> I, I'm, I think it's fair to say that there are still large uncertainties in, in the magnitude of climate change, uh, the climate change effect on agricultural drought. But it is certainly something that we have very high confidence in um, as a future risk uh, to our country as well as across across the world. Well, I'd like to go to the fourth key message. I'll read this one. Substantial reductions in western U.S. winter and spring snowpack are projected as the climate warms. Earlier spring melt and reduced snow water equivalent have been formally attributed to human-induced warming and will very likely be exacerbated as the climate continues to warm. I'll focus on this part. Under higher emission scenarios and assuming no change to current water resources management, 
<clears throat> chronic long duration hydro hydrological drought is increasingly possible by the end of this century. Now the words chronic long duration originally I wrote as permanent and reviewers had issues with the the uh, word permanent because you know nothing is ever permanent. What I really meant by permanent is permanent on human time scales. Um, you know not centuries but millennia and um, I think <clears throat> I would stand by um, for any practical purposes that um, the following figure will will um, is is permanent in any real sense and this is because of uh, in the western United States the reliance <clears throat> of water resource managers on the snowpack as a reservoir well, this picture shows wintertime <clears throat> uh, US snowpack um, in a simulation that does a remarkably well, a good job of simulating the observations. On the left is the simulation of the historical period, um, I think it's 1979 to present, um, from a version of the community atmospheric model that is very high resolution, I think it's uh, uh, 15 or 12 kilometers in this region. And, and the student who did this, it was part of his PhD, PhD uh, thesis, Alan Rhodes at the University of California, Davis, um, looked at a number of models. This was the one that did the best job in reproducing uh, the observations. And then he ran it, ran it under f two future uh, conditions under this RCP 8.5 uh, uh, high emission scenario, one at the middle of the century and one at the end of the century. And this picture made by my colleague uh, uh, Hari Krishnan at Berkeley Lab uh, shows quite clearly by the end of the century there's a dramatic reduction in the snowpack. So where I live in California, we're relying on the Sierra Nevada. And if you compare the white regions in, in this figure right here that I'm highlighting to the, the uh, uh, simulation of today, which is a pretty good simulation, there's practically nothing left. And in fact, the chart shows that in the Sierras, there's a 90% reduction in the snow water equivalent. That's the uh, the amount of actual water contained in snow um, in in the Sierra Nevada. Essentially, all of the Sierra California snowpack disappears under this three and a half degree warmer world. By the middle of the century, the, there's still a dramatic reduction. About about 20% is is gone in the Sierras. In some of these other important uh, snowpack reservoirs, um, it, 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 it disappears a little bit faster. It, it, a, lot of the, a lot of how the melt proceeds depends on the elevation of the, uh, of the mountains where the snowpack is. The lower, uh, lower catchments uh, will disappear uh, sooner than the higher ones. So what's left at the end of the century are basically the high mountains. This is... Um, I think one of the marquee results of our chapter, and um, I would like to see attention focused on this. I think this is um, a future scenario that is rather dire, and um, if we don't plan for this uh, one way or another, uh, we have serious problems for uh, the socioeconomic drought, which is at the end of that hierarchy of droughts that I talked about. Moving on to floods in key message number five, detectable changes in some classes of flood frequency have occurred in parts of the United States and are a mix of increases and decreases. Extreme precipitation, one of the controlling factors in flood statistics, is observed to have generally increased and is projected to con continue to do so across the United States in a warming atmosphere. However, formal attribution approaches have not established a significant connection of increased riverine flooding to human-induced climate change and the timing of any emergence of a future detectable anthropogenic change in, in flooding is unclear. Well, if droughts are complicated, floods are even more so. Um, the, the, there is a word that was added in review, the riverine flooding, um, because um, uh, coastal flooding from uh, sea level rise has uh, pretty clearly been attributed to, to uh, human-induced climate change. So. The floods of uh, Hurricane Sandy, for instance, are clearly uh, worse because of um, because of the foot of, of sea level rise than if it hadn't happened. But in the rivers, it's a little more difficult, and um, and it, it 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 may be a little uh, um, 
uh, well, I guess I, I guess it's easy enough to explain some some of it. You know, I, I talked about how the seasonal precipitation trends that we observe are are largely natural, and so by by uh, uh, extension, any observed trends in seasonal flooding of large rivers, you know, like the Missouri or the Ohio, or or even the Mississippi, is also likely natural. Except that there's a complicating factor of late season rain on snow events. And so I think it's fair to say that this is a pretty uh, much emerging science um, and uh, it's difficult to make a statement. Now for flood zones, smaller rivers, which are um, not necessarily determined by uh, a large winter, the melting of large winter snowpacks, um, but rather are uh, caused by extreme precipitation events, the, you you might expect that there'd be more progress on this. Um, the um, extreme precipitation has been formally attributed to have increased due to human changes in the climate system, and um, uh, this paper goes back almost ten years now. And since these are the causes of flooded floods, why don't we have um, attribution studies on flooding? Well. There are a number of factors, one of which is that uh, um, rivers are often um, manipulated for other reasons, um, you know, dams and, and canals and dikes and levees and all um, can influence uh, stream flow. Um, but another, another uh, um, important uh, um, reason for that is, is simply that the, the attribution community is rather small. Um, and it's limited, and there are only so many people to work on this, and they have, have for one reason or another, not um, turned their attention to the hydrological models needed to make, to, to draw the connections from extreme precipitation changes to uh, flooding changes. I expect that will be changing um, because this problem has been recognized in the community. Now, there are some... some uh, I wrote, labeled this flood attribution studies, and I probably should have really called it extreme precipitation attribution studies that are related to floods. Um, I'm going to show two, one of which is talked about in the um, report, but for some reason I forgot to put into the table, um, so you'll pardon me for that. There are two studies of the September 2013 Colorado floods, one by Marty Hurling at, at NOAA uh, um, ESRL in um, Boulder, Colorado, who find no influ human influence, and then one led by um, Party Paul and myself, finding a large influence. And um, you might think that these are inconsistent, and they might be, but they also might not be, as they really consider the issue very differently. Um, Marty's paper has uh, fewer conditions on it in terms of uh, assumptions about uh, the large-scale meteorological patterns responsible for this event whereas we made some other assumptions that, that, uh, that there was no influence on that. Um, it points out that the attribution of storms is very difficult. Um, this picture shows some damage from the flooding, I think, in Jamestown, Colorado, from pictures from FEMA. Here's the principal result from our paper, um, which attributed a 30% increase in the precipitation of this event um, to climate change, which is a lot, actually, when you think about it. And it shows, again, two sets of simulations. In this case, the uh, world that was um, is in blue. That's this histogram and this approximate uh, distribution. And um, the world that might have been had rumors not interfered with the climate system in green. And the observations is this, um, this uh, uh, black line. And this, this picture is kind of interesting to talk about for a minute because it shows that in both the world that was in blue and the world that wasn't in green, this event was possible. But the chances of this were uh, considerably increased and that the average of these two hindcast um, uh, simulations is shifted uh, towards heavier events by about 30%. Hurricane Harvey is another storm where there have been now four independent studies, attribution studies, um, uh, addressing uh, uh, flooding in the greater Houston area. And Harvey is not included in Volume 1 because Volume 1 was finished before 
the storm occurred, so it could not have been. It's briefly mentioned in Volume 2. It was a very unusual storm because it stalled off of Texas for so long. In some stations, there was over five feet of, of uh, rain accumulated during the storm, which is a, a, I think one could easily say that's a copious amount. So four independent studies found a large increase. Um, all four studies, which are completely independent in terms of both the people involved and the methodologies used. So that, to me, suggests that I can make this statement that there's a large attributable human increase with some high confidence, uh, one of which was 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 uh, uh, my colleague Mark Risser at Berkeley Lab and myself. We, we had the highest numbers. We found that likely, and likely is one of these reserved words, um, that there's at least a 19% increase with a best estimate of almost 40%, another very large number as in the, uh, the Boulder, Harvest Boulder analysis. Our uh, colleagues in uh, Oxford and uh, in the Netherlands um, wrote a paper finding a very likely, that's even a stronger statistical uh, significance, of a 15% increase, but a somewhat lower range, which um, encompasses um, our estimate. And then recently, um, go ahead. Hello? Is there a question? Oh, I'm sorry, we had a clarifying question. Uh, Caitlin Jensen asked, would you please define extreme precipitation? Oh, OK. Um, let me finish talking about that, and I'll get, get uh, talk about Harvey, and I'll get to that. Um, uh, so for. Uh, um, then, then the paper I actually like the most, you know, more than mine, in fact, is by um, uh, Wang et al., which came out in April, and they had a best estimate of a 20% increase in the observed amount of precipitation, uh, in, in the precipitation that was observed um, from, from humans. Now, the question is, can I define extreme precipitation? And the answer is no. Um, extreme precipitation means different things to different people. Um, in the... In, in so you know a precise definition isn't really um, isn't really uh, um, particularly uh, doable. Um, mainly, what we mean is something that is a uh, uh, unusually large um, at the tail of the distribution of of uh, um, uh, in the Harvey case weekly precipitation or precipitation um, induced from um, uh, um, uh, tropical cyclones. Um, so one can define define it as some percentile, or um, say the 99th percentile in the distribution of daily values, or one can look at it as a very long um, uh, return period value. So the once in 20 year event is is uh, something that a metric that we've used. Um, but no, extreme precipitation, unfortunately, is a word that is not precisely defined and um, and means different things in different analyses, I'm afraid. Now we're going to move on to uh, fires. And uh, um, in the interest of full disclosures, I have to say before uh, this chapter was written, I had no real experience in uh, uh, the literature of uh, forest fires and climate change. And so I had to read a lot of papers. I relied a lot on my other um, uh, 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 lead authors from other chapters, particularly the Alaska chapter. Um, but we did come up with a statement. And we wrote that the incidence of large forest fires in the western United States and Alaska has increased since the early 1980s and projected a further increase in those regions as the climate warmed with profound changes to certain ecosystems. Uh, this picture is from Cal the California fires of last year from FEMA. Um, the, as my assessment of the literature was was interesting. Um, it turns out the literature is very, there are very few papers outside of the Western United States on the, the linkages between climate change and fire um, anywhere else in the world, in fact. Um, that's the area that has re achieved, uh, that has received the most attention, and even that literature is rather uh, limited in scope. And so this is an area where there there is clearly a need for for more research. We were only able to find one or two papers about the eastern United States, um, and and it's difficult to make an assessment when there are so few studies. 
this picture um, is in uh, um, is in the report. Um, it's taken directly from a paper, and I've forgotten the, the reference, but that's in the report. And it shows observed uh, uh, trends in uh, a large number of, of uh, regions in the western United States. This is the actual observations um, from 1984 to 2011. And in um, the, so this red picture is across all the regions. You can see that there's a, that there's a trend since since the 1980s. And in most of these regions, there are there are um, there are trends um, that these large fires large fires are greater than 800 um, uh, acres, I think it is, and. Um, um, this this is part of the evidence for for the the key message. Um, one uh, uh, one notable exception is California, um, where there's a bit of a decrease. Now this doesn't include the large fires of last year. I'm not sure that would change the trend line, um, but I would note this is the area where people live and fire prevention activities are are uh, are the highest. So some, some comments about it, that two human factors have increased the risk of the fire. One is forest management changes, which is not climate change, and that increases the availability of fuel, or it has. Um, there also are also some, some uh, changes in, in um, uh, fire suppression management that are, that are relevant. But the climate change part is basically warmer temperatures, which leads to drier conditions greater evapotranspiration. That tends to make uh, forests and other ecosystems more flammable because they're dried out earlier so that, so that the forest, the fire season can be longer. And, and um, I think both of these effects, both the, the, the management changes and, and the climate change are important factors. Attribution, both attribution and projection studies are pretty limited. They're limited to very, very, uh, um, uh, small regions, but we did conclude that increases in, in summertime temperatures will most certainly extend the fire season, um, perhaps in some places to be nearly the entire year. Um, we were thinking California that, in that, uh, in that uh, particular instance. Um, but there are other factors that, um, that may reduce um, uh, fuel availability, so that would sort of counteract some of the forest management changes, uh, mainly uh, um, uh, some decrease the decrease the the increases in agricultural drought conditions, which would um, uh, cause uh, um, uh, trees not to grow quite as much if they if they're restricted by water. In some places, they are, and as well as increases in in insect um, infestations, which uh, uh, could kill trees earlier than than they, they might otherwise live to. So this is the end of my presentation. Um, this is the website for uh, the climate change, uh, the climate science um, special report um, and chapter eight. You, you, you just go to this website. You can pull down any of the chapters by clicking on this link that I'm pointing at right now. Um, you can download the, uh, the PDF file by, by going through the downloads thing. Um, but I think think the the real way to read this report, at least to, the, to browse it, is to to use the rather excellent um, uh, web interface. And so um, I'm available for questions. And here's my email if you have questions uh, that you would like to send me later on. Thank you very much. Okay, great, Thank you, Michael. Folks so online, if you have questions, you can type them into the chat box. Um, I do see Mike. Napoleon has a comment, uh, Michael, it says he is quoting a paper, Denison et al., Large Wildlife Trends in the Western U.S., 1984 to 2011. Maybe you used that, or maybe he was suggesting that. Um, let's see, can I see the questions here? Yeah, you should. You might just need to look down on your chat. Yeah, I do see that. Um, I, I um, gosh, I don't recall if we, um, if we, uh, if, if, if we that might be where that figure is from, I'd have to check. Oh, that was the reference for the slide map. Yeah, okay. For, so that was that was the that was the um, that's figure that's what figure eight point four is, I think. Okay, thanks. 
Jennifer Dumoy asks, could you show the web address for the chapter? NCA4 is not yet published. Oh, actually, uh, NCA4 Volume 1 is, is, um, is published. Um, and that's also called Climate Science Special Report. So I'll put that, I'll put that up again uh, briefly. Um, sorry, this is the wrong presentation. Um, but but uh, um, all, you have, all you have to really do is, uh, is search for climate, which I did right here, Climate Science uh, Special Report. And, uh, and that, will, that will bring it up right away. Okay, and she was talking about volume two, which isn't probably out till December or next year, right? That that is true. So that would be unavailable at this time. Okay. And then Christina asked, did the last wildfire wildfire slide indicate that pest infestations would reduce fuel for wildfires? Wouldn't it increase fuel due to more dead trees, at least initially, uh, e.g., bark beetles in California? You know that. So that's that's probably a reasonable um, a reasonable conclusion. Although I don't believe that there's a literature um, for for uh, there was that there wasn't a literature for us to assess on that. The insect infestation um, uh, statements that um, uh, we made uh, were in response to um, review comments. I don't remember if they're from the National Academy or the um, or the public. the 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 whole report, I should add, was was is extensively reviewed. Um, that doesn't mean the report is perfect in any by any means. Um, but the but the um, the report went through a public review where pretty much anybody could um, uh, um, make a comment. It also went through um, a national a review from a National Academy panel. And then finally, a review um, uh, from the uh, 13 agencies responsible um, for the report. And, um, and in, in fact, this particular um, uh, part of the chapter had um, quite a bit of back and forth between uh, uh, some of the agencies and the lead authors. Okay. And then Tom McNewson, who just presented last week, uh, comments, Mike, good presentation. Last week I mentioned a new study just out, June 15th, Journal of Climate, showing detectable and attributable increasing trends in precipitation over the northern and northeast U.S., annual mean and mainly in fall season. Could have implications for increasing flood risk. So let me just bring up a, right, a picture on this. This is saying... Uh, I have not seen this paper. I'll have to read it. Um, increasing trends in over. Okay, so so that would be. Now, now I've forgotten. Did he say the northwest or the northeast? The north it has to be the northeast yeah that is a large a large signal um, and when I go to the projections there is a projected um, um, uh, change but it's it's projected to be a relatively small change I'm clearly going to go have to read this paper so I can't make a further comment about it okay do we have a question in the room no okay folks Folks online, are there any more questions? You can type them into the chat. Oh, Tom says, also, the observed increase is stronger than in historical runs. Yes, but but my comment, my reply to that would be if, if, the, um, if the observed increase is largely natural, then I wouldn't expect the historical runs to reproduce it except by chance. Okay. And Norman John says, awesome presentation. Thank you. Let's see if there are a few more questions. Oh, Alan says, I apologize, but what was the conclusion regarding bark beetles and increased fuel? No need to voice this, but if someone could type answer, please. Okay. Well, the, um, the bark beetle thing is an interesting uh, um, uh, 
topic, some, some folks would like to draw a connection between increased bark beetle infestations and climate change. I, I, I'm not aware of a, of, a, of a formal attribution study on that. Um, the, uh, um, I'm, I'm stretching my memory here. I think the comments from the uh, the expert review were that um, that this could infect the health of forests and um, when they're not burning, and so that when they were burning, uh, when they did finally catch on fire, they would the the trees wouldn't be as healthy, so they wouldn't have uh, they wouldn't be as as uh, there wouldn't be as much to burn. But again, I think. You know, it's important to to uh, to um, well, two things. One is this is way outside of my expertise, um, but also the literature is very uh, very sparse. Okay, thanks. And then John Callahan asks, would you recommend another drought index other than PDSI to look for trends in any one of the types of drought? Well, for um, for precipitation, um, there's a, there's a, another index called the Standardized Precipitation Index, and that depends only on precipitation. I think that's a good one for meteorological drought. For agricultural drought, I think the um, this this is um, uh, it's an area that that we need to do more research on. The some of the reasons for uh, the criticisms of the um, the Palmer Drought Severity Index carry over to the climate models themselves. And so um, initially I had thought, well, why don't we just look at soil moisture deficits directly? And um, that, that I think is probably where we want to go. But... Um, I think some more critical uh, uh, model evaluation analyses um, have to be done before we can, well, before we can set, be be confident in the quantitative statements. But I think the qualitative statement that you know soils will dry out as it gets warmer is uh, um, is is based on fundamental understanding of the climate system. The only, in my mind, the way the way to uh, the 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 uncertainties are how to best express that in a in a in a quantitative way, which is really necessary in order to um, uh, be able to uh, take action. And then Richard Hine comments, "How about Penman Monteith based drought indices?" That's an improvement, um, but I think this. This uh, paper by Millie and Dunn that we uh, we uh, cite um, in our chapter um, also finds that these are less than perfect. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I just wanted to note to you. I don't know if you knew this, Michael, but yesterday there was another NOAA seminar called the Southwest Drought and Wildfire Status: Impacts and Outlook. And I was unable to attend, but I imagine maybe some of the people on the list did attend that. I was on an airplane, so I couldn't watch. Yeah. Unfortunately. By Nancy Sullover, Arizona State climatologist Ed Delgado, National Program Manager for National Interagency Fire Center. And uh, it was sponsored by the National Integrated Drought Information System, NIDIS, in partnership with the National Weather Service. Uh, Joni Newcomer says it was excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Joni. Or oh, that's for the other for the other talk. Yeah, I'm sure it was excellent. Oh, it's funny you're back to back. I didn't. I mean, I noticed it yesterday, but I couldn't participate in it. So, do you do attribution for a lot of different types of phenomena? Michael, then I, I mean, you've applied your talents here. So, yeah, the um, so attribution of individual events has um, was basically a, an area of research um, invented by Miles Allen at the uh, University of Oxford following the um, rather devastating um, uh, and long 
hot summer of 2003 in Central Europe. And since then, it's become its own cottage industry. And there are a series of, I think, six or perhaps seven uh, supplements to the State of the Climate Report annually in the, um, the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, typically released around uh, December. And um, um, there are, oh, I don't know, maybe a hundred or more different events that have been analyzed in those publications alone, plus the rest of the literature. And so um, what's emerged is that um, the attribution of heat waves um, has become fairly standard. Um, I, I actually maintain it can be done in advance to, um, to, to some degree of accuracy. Um, the, um, the analysis, the, the attribution of, of wet seasons um, has been done in dry seasons, as I showed with the, uh, the droughts, um, uh, with some success. And most recently, trying to attribute individual extreme storms has um, um, taken off, I mean, really in the last year, um, specifically with Harvey. Um, but there are now analyses that are coming um, in the, that are in review now on Hurricane Maria and Irma um, and retrospective to other hurricanes um, that uh, um, we'll probably see in the literature in the next couple of months. And so it's still a rapidly developing field. Um, and, um, you know, mistakes will be made as, as in any endeavor. But um, I think we're, we're finding um, that there are many extreme weather events, both hot and wet and dry, that uh, have varying degrees of uh, human comp human induced component. Okay. Well, if there are, no, are there any more questions? It's almost the top of the hour, and that's about when we end. So, any other questions? Oh, we've got someone, maybe. I just, uh, Trisha Frank says, thank you. And I just want to point out a link where we will be linking these recordings if you want to find them later. And if you're interested in getting a PDF of the presentation that Michael's presented today, just uh, drop your name and email in the poll that's listed there, and I will send it out to you probably later on today or tomorrow. So it looks like there are no more questions. Michael, thank you so much for presenting today, and uh, hope we see you all next week for uh, on August 2nd for Potential Surprises, Compound Extremes and Tipping ele Elements by Radley Horton. So that will be the same time, August 2nd, 12 to 1, same login and everything. So. Thanks again for coming, everyone. And Michael, thanks so much for presenting. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And I would recommend um, uh, tuning in to Radley's presentation. It's bound to be very interesting. Great. Thank you so much. All right. I'm going to respond to a few of these requests on the chat, and then I'll log off. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.